Hey everyone, Papercut here with some breakdowns of the EGC TV tournament games that have been happening recently. I've been really enjoying watching these games and I thought it'd be really interesting to show you, especially for those of you who can't watch all the games, show you some of the key games where I think there are some great examples of things to learn from, showing those things visually, giving some tips, and allowing you a chance to if you're interested in seeing it fully for yourself or seeing more from the series, go watch them. I want to give a huge shout out to EGC TV for hosting these tournaments. They're so much fun and there's so many great things to learn from. To post them on their YouTube where you can go and watch those games easily. Um, I also want to point you guys towards um, the pro players themselves. All the names you see on these replays, if you search them on a on a, on the game, you can actually go look at the replays. They they almost all the top level players have the replays open, which is amazing for our ability to go and just watch good gameplay from their perspective. Um, so just thank you to everyone involved. I hope you guys enjoy these videos. If you're interested in coaching, learning more, getting help in AOE 4, and just having a place where you can just ask any question you have and work through some of these problems and get better, um, I highly suggest you check out my coaching discord at the description of this video. Join on uh, and get better at AOE 4. Um, with that, Enjoy the video. First, let's look at Nubadon versus Louis MT. Louis MT is a player who is known as the up and up player from China, and you really see it in the series. This first game, where Louis plays Order of the Dragon and Nubadon plays English on Coastal Cliffs, really exemplifies the play style of maintaining space and buying time into your work condition. Louis MT as Order of the Dragon is a slower sieve, but stronger with the recent eco changes from the patch. But he knows that trying to fight English straight up in Feudal can be tough. With Feudal's ability to mass Lombos quickly and order the dragon's slower build rate on units, he had to make sure he just bought himself time to get to a better power position, whether that be in Castle or Imperial. And boy, is he gonna do a lot of work to delay until he can finally find the comp that's gonna win him the game. Going into Castle, Louis immediately notices that Numadon drops a barracks and a council hall and starts pumping units. He actually goes up with a wheelbarrow to immediately help his Order of the Dragon units. It's a really important eco upgrade and drops stable and archery range. His goal is going to be to use that uh, horsemen, sorry, horsemen and archers to slow this push. The second Numadon sees the drop of both the stable and the archery range, he immediately retreats. First goal done. Louis is able to buy himself space. His eco is protected. Now he just needs to keep buying time, buying time, not letting Numenon walk on him. Another key part is what to notice that Numenon has to do in response. With seeing horsemen and seeing archers, it's a natural that he's going to want to go longbow and spear. This is going to be a key part of the game, as Louis is going to consistently use the slow moving comp that Numenon's using to his advantage when he's trying to delay this game. You see this delay in action here. Noticing, and a big thing here is Louis scouting the entire time. Noticing that Numidon's pushing up, Louis pulls his villagers off gold. Keep in mind, he got all the upgrades he needed. He got wheelbarrow, he got arrow defense, he's getting arrow attack, and he got double broadaxe. Numidon sees the horsemen and the archers running out of the base, and fearing for his own eco, pulls all of his units back. Once again, noticing no gold villagers, afraid of a TC, and knowing that Louis is lurking with just one horseman running around, he pulls all his units back. Instead of using his numerical advantage to try to pick villagers, is now chasing ghosts, just Louis all around the map. We then once again notice Louis's goal in this raid at the back of Numidon's base. Seeing that two spearmen are guarding his goal, he walks up and pokes the spears with his archers, and then runs. He's now overstaying his welcome. He's not trying to pick a vill. He's trying to be chased. He's trying to keep Numidon in his base. And already it's working. Numidon is sitting on his villagers on the boar, and he's just following around of his archers, searching for Louis, but never actually willing to go in and try to take a fight. Louis then snipes Numidon's scout, making it even harder for him to have vision, and once again, keeping him pending in his own base, when really, he probably early on could have done a lot of damage before Numidon, sorry, before Louis could have gained more units. Louis then uses the space to get on the hunt, which is going to be a huge boost to his eco and allow him to get castle. Noticing that Numenon is sitting in his own base, sitting on boar, and continuously chasing him around because of the fear of horsemen raids, Louis is going to use this to go castle. Castle is vital for Order of the Dragon in this matchup. Getting the relics is going to be huge for his ability to keep Massey an army, especially with how food and gold heavy the units he wants to make are. 
In Castle, we want to we once again see the power of Louis' horsemen and the threat they cause. Using the horsemen to continuously poke the left side, Numenon has to keeps falling back for fear of both the archers and the horsemen companies running. This space he creates allows his scholars, scholars, I'm sorry, his prelates to go out and gather relics across the map. If Louis can get three or four relics, his economy will be in a great position. It's crazy how Louis is constantly moving side to side of his army. Once he pulls Numan on the left side, he falls back, rotates right, and then pushes onto the wall on the right side. Once again, his goal is not to actually go in and raid. There's an opportunity he'll do it. The second he sees Numan's army, he's going to fall back. And fall back with his with the units that are slower first, his archers, he keeps these alive at all times. As Order of the Dragon is critical, you don't lose units for free. While his horsemen are faster, he pushes forward to buy time for his archers to get away, and then wall falls backward. While this is happening, his scholars are taking sacred sites. Once again, buying time, creating space, getting as much eco as he can, trying to save up to a good push point. He knows if he takes a fight too early against the English, such as going to his town center too soon, or fighting against the mass he's not ready for and loses his army, it'll take too long to remake. So he's being very careful. Numenon, on the other hand, is just afraid to take a fight against Louis. It's hard to gauge how strong an Order of the Dragon army is, and often you'll see people be hesitant once they start seeing larger numbers of Order of the Dragon units. At the roughly the 18 minute mark, Louis realizes he needs to take a risk. If he keeps sitting 1TC against 2TC, which he saw on an earlier raid, he's gonna eventually just lose out, lose out eco wise, even with the relics. So he splits his horsemen, goes on a slight raid, and uses that space to go and get Swabia. Swabia will allow him to get villagers to match. Once again, he knows he's probably not going to get back in this space here, but the goal is just to keep Newman on far back, that when he actually goes Swabia like he is now, he has time to defend it. Once Louis hits Imp, he does a very massive job of switching comps to try to find something that counters Numenon's current comp. While the Age of happens, he switches to Men at Arms, which can take a lot more damage. He also immediately gets out of Maganel, which will force Numenon back. Hitting Imp was also huge in this match, because Numenon was nowhere near Imp when he got there. Forcing Numenon to commit to some sort of attack, some sort of fight, to try to make sure that Louis doesn't get Swabia for free. This is where things are going to start to get dicey for Louis. He once again uses his horsemen by space and time, sending his horsemen on consistent raids through Numenon's base, who never actually walled up the center part of it, to continuously keep Numenon back. Louis does a massive job of never losing these horsemen either, but continuously attacking, moving, attacking, and moving. Numenon, to his credit, is going to really try to gain center map. He knows if he can cut off the gold from Louis, then, even with the relics, Louis will eventually just not have the eco to survive. Louis then does the classic HRE, Order of the Dragon trick, of getting Bombard Towers up. While he's done that, he's able to break through the wall of his horsemen, and he's never actually, he kills a few vills, but his goal, once again, is not just to sit on vills or to lose these horsemen. He's constantly moving around the back, forcing Numenon to move villagers, forcing him to waste units back here, forcing him to just lose focus on the back here, making his push not as effective, as every time he tries to push, he's responding to the horsemen in the back of the base, and Louis has just been able to stabilize, keep his Fabio alive, and now he's moving into a power position. Like just by just printing, print. Now a big part of this whole plan for Louis is maintaining this force, not losing it, so that when he needs to commit, it can survive. Noticing the Berkshire dropped in the center of the map, Louis knows that he only has one gold in the center that he can now reasonably have, as well as the one trade post for late Imperial trade. He's already guessing this game's gonna go late. So using his force, he's able to secure both the gold with the keep, and later he's gonna secure stone walls to protect this trade and power his economy for the rest of the game. Now, Order the Dragon Imperial is kind of tough, and the later it goes, the harder it gets for Order of the Dragon. The reason being is that it's just hard to mass an army big enough to finish the game, especially against the Civ like English, that can just consistently send units at you. The thing Louis knows he can't let this become is a fight where everything's stonewalled and you're fighting in one spot. He will just continuously get overwhelmed if he takes that fight. Instead, Louis will continuously send raids into Numenon's base, and they're never very large, just things to distract him. He's going to bust through the walls and send one or two men-at-arms on runarounds. He's going to send horsemen later into the back of his base. Once again, these are not necessarily killing a lot of villagers, but it's just making Numenon have to react. Numenon is never able to just get up the stone walls to stop these raids. He's consistently being pulled side to side, which Louis will eventually take you to his advantage, being able to then get the siege out to kill the Berkshire and push his way in. 
it's going to take multiple unit switches. He's going to switch into Gilded Horsemen. He's going to switch into Men at Arms. He's finally going to switch into Lanchnex, which is going to be the team that wins in the game. The only reason Louis is able to do that is because he continuously buys his time with raids of one or few units, keeping the English off balance, and letting him set up his eco in a comp that wins in the game. Just amazing stuff by Louis. So if you're looking to see a sort of distraction play style to buy yourself time, watch this game. It's a masterclass. The next game we want to look at is between B and Lucifron. This was an amazing series, but I want to focus in on one game, the last game between them, which was French, Lucifron, and B on Delhi. The map, Bridges, a custom map that is a pretty wide open map with resources on the north and south protected by bridges, as well as a pretty wide open area with most of your resources away from your base. This game, I think, really emphasized the power of waiting for the perfect time to strike. Timing attacks are often a phrase to use in AoE 4 to mean you're setting up a certain time to attack that best fits your Civ and is worse for your opponent's Civ. I think we see Lucifer on here do an amazing job of picking the perfect time to attack. You will often see pro players delay, delay, delay fights to the perfect moment, and here we see Lucifer on do that. He knows that the Delhi lose steam as they lose food. They burn through food super fast. They're buying, they're getting so many units with efficient production. They're making unit after unit after unit. They go in on Gazi, which are food expensive, and their berry sieves. They get a lot of food quickly, but they'll burn through that. And once they're out of berries, all of a sudden, they just stop making units. So Lucifer's whole goal is, how can I extend this out to when B loses food, I can take back control and end him in a timing push. First, let's talk openings and some interesting decisions each player makes. First, B does the usual tower of victory drop, but instead of doing just two scholars, he does three. I think this is interesting because it obviously shows he wants to do a more research focused opening. He's going to get all of his eco techs faster. He's going to get his military techs faster. And I think the whole point of this is because knowing that French have an eco that naturally scares, scales with faster village production, he wants to try, try to get his eco upgrades up even faster to make his villagers more efficient. If he can get his military upgrades even faster, it might allow him to take a fight that is better for him early on. At the same time, Lucifer does the normal opening of School of Calvary into a quick knight. B is going to get out of barracks and get out spears immediately, but then he's going to drop two uh, blacksmiths before even going to Ghazis. Once again, an interesting decision. Usually, I think you'd see most Delhi players go barracks immediately into Ghazi raiders just to try to catch the first few archers coming across the field. Once again, B is going to care more about getting blacksmith upgrades to try to give his units that early advantage and hopefully just take a really good fight to him early on. B's aware of his limitations too. He knows he basically has this berries in the back that's safe, but then his berries in the front and his deer in the front are in danger. Same with the deer across the pond. So if he's going to want to be able to be safe and get this food, he needs the best military possible and he can't lose an early fight. Lastly, we're going to see Lucifer drop two archery ranges. He knows that his point of victory is actually building a archer mass. Knights are well and good, but B has two things that counter knights. He has spears and Ghazi raiders. What's actually going to do Lucifer better is getting a huge mass of archers. And since Delhi has faster shooting archers with the Tower of Victory, he just needs to outmass him. We can see Lucifer's strategy play out leading up to the 10 minute mark. He is using his knights to try to keep B in his base. He's constantly rotating, constantly threatening to attack, but never quite diving. And he's seeing this huge buildup of spearmen. He's even trying to cut off the, bear, the palace side wall building and just trying to keep B, once again, in his base. He can also, if he can force B to create a lot of spears, then he can show up with his archer mass. One thing you'll often notice that a lot of these players do is that when they're switching to a unit, they don't bring them over until they have a mass. So Lucifer didn't, tickle, didn't trickle in archers one by one. He waited till he had a solid mass and is now crossing so that next time the spears come out he can actually pick a few of his archer mass. This also protects him from Ghazi Raiders. If he tried to leak over one archer at a time, if B got out two Ghazi Raiders in a sneaky manner, he could pick off those archers before Lucifer can do anything. So Lucifer is both preventing his reinforcements getting picked off, but also making sure he's showing up with a strong unit grouping to attack with. B on the other hand is massing. He built a lot of spears, so he's not getting overwhelmed. Now he's flipping into Ghazis. He's then soon going to flip into archers. And once again, a huge thing for Delhi is just building up a massive archer mass. If you can get a 40 archer, 50 archer archer mass with the Tower of Victory attack speed boost of 20%, they become just absolutely deadly. 
Nearing the 10 minute mark, we see their strategies playing out once again. B is raiding with Ghazi raiders continuously. He is desperate to try to get Lucifron to fall back from his position and chase his Ghazis. Unfortunately, he never checks Lucifron's deer, so he had easy villager kills available to him, just completely kept focusing on the gold. And you understand why. French need a lot of gold. At the same time, Lucifron does not necessarily want to pull back. He has successfully kept B off the sacred sites, which is key for Delhi. And it's just keeping him in his base. He knows there's not a lot of food back there. And B is already on his second berry bush and is running out of deer. So he's going to need to push out for food sooner rather than later. At this 11 minute mark, I feel like B makes one of his biggest mistakes. He walls up one side of the bridge, but doesn't wall up the second bridge. Meaning that when his scholar goes onto the sacred site, you're going to have one of Lucifer's knights come and kill it. Once again, B's not getting any of the sacred sites. B, on the other hand, is afraid of sending any units. He knows he is barely outproducing Lucifron right now. Which out to Lucifron, his macro has been amazing. He is always sitting on near zero food, always sitting on near zero gold, and is only putting a little bit of extra wood, but he is constantly producing. He has a second stable out, he has two archer ranges out, and his units are constantly streaming across the field. He has more archers than B, while B, split between Ghazi Raiders and Spearmen, does not have the archer mess that he wants. Lucifron has not made a knight now for probably four minutes, almost just pure archers, because he knows if he can just out-archer B, he'll probably win the engagement. And every time B starts to walk out, Lucifron backs up, but keeps close enough where B is afraid of leaving his base, because he's afraid if he leaves, all of a sudden there's going to be knights in his base killing his villagers. So he's in this precarious spot where he wants to take a fight, he wants to push out, but he's not quite sure if he can win it, so he just stays paralyzed, which is Delhi, that, that's the worst place to be in right now, is sitting in this no man's land of not getting sacred sites, of not getting the villager kills you want. At this point, at 12 minutes, he has zero villager kills, so Lucifer is playing a very good defensive game at home while keeping the pressure on a B. And once again, he's not going to throw his units away. If he tries to attack right now and loses them, the worst thing you can do against Delhi is lose a fight early on. They'll outproduce you, they'll just mow you down. Lucifer is waiting for the perfect time to attack, but not just sitting in his base to do that. He's staying aggressive, but smart aggressive. This is going to be my plug for a item I often forget to get, which is textiles. Textiles is so important when you're facing a sip that likes to raid, like Delhi. Watch at this 13 minute mark. I think Lucifer's villagers should be sponsored by textiles. He is sending out villagers right now to build a tower and get back on the deer. B has timed this perfectly. You're seeing this and you should think, oh, Lucifer's going to be down all these villagers right here. Look what happens. Now, one thing, horseman pathing sucks ass. So <laughs> this is just really unfortunate for B. But um, Lucifer's going to lose no, a one, two, three villagers. Three. That was it. That was it. He had... Five there at least, easy to kill, with all these other ones off the wood line, and he's not going to lose any of them. He's going to lose a few more here, four, but I mean, overall, like, he's so confident in his villager's health that he pulls the shivs out, and since he's under TC, he has to leave. He can't just throw all these Ghazis away. So this was a huge, I mean, once again, shout out to textiles, get textiles. What this did do is that this pulled Lucifron back, because when he saw that many Ghazis, he feels like he has to go and respond to this. How is B going to respond? Because he's already on farms. He, he realized he was out of food, he has to switch to farm. So he's using his wood on farms right now. So is Lucifron technically, but I think that's mostly because he knew those Ghazis were out and he's afraid of walking out. But he is on the boar, which once again, if B had gotten the boar villagers down here, that would have been huge. B's just not checking the food resources as well as he should, because man, this, this boar is single-handedly powering Lucifron's food economy right now. At the 14 minute mark, we have B cornering, I'm sorry, B Lucifron cornering B's Ghazi Raiders and hunting them down. B is leaving his base because he realizes he needs to take an engagement right now. He finally got Lucifron to pull back. He finally has some more space. He needs to take a fight. If he's going to get this deer, if he's going to get these berries, he needs to go right now. Especially because he's losing Ghazi Raiders on this raid for really nothing. So he wants to take a fight right now. And this is a good time for him to take a fight. He has more military. And if he can, and he doesn't have to necessarily kill all Lucifron's forces, but man, you don't want Lucifron to enter castle with 14 knights to upgrade. So if he's gonna walk out and take this fight, and man, is this an interesting one. 
the, the, the micro on this is crazy. So we have B, he has obviously split his groups into three. Spears, archers, Gazis. It's pretty obvious what he wants. He wants Gazis to get the archers. He needs the spears to protect his archers. He needs his archers to poke out the other archers while his spears just continuously go at the knights. He will shoot at the knights with his archers. But here's a big issue. This isn't all of B's army. He still has archers. He still has roughly... 10 units of military not here right now. now that's the same for lucifron lucifron has four knights and three spears but the issue is he's on lucifron side of the map so reinforcements of lucifron are going to get there first lucifron's going to delay he's going to set the fight plane up his archers come up and take great hits he's just trying to hunt down these spears you notice his his archers are only shooting spears which is such an important micro from him once the spears are gone his knights will feast on everything else that's here at this point, it's really hard. B is losing spearmen like crazy, and he just didn't mass up enough spears. So his spears can't take all these archer fire. This is beautiful. If you are a knight sieve, it is worthwhile for you to really double click on your archers and shift click all those spears because you gotta take them out. Because now his knights are just gonna rip through B's archers. Watch this play out. Powerful. Now, B is still going to do plenty of damage. B's, B is now focus firing these knights because he just he just wants to get rid of the knights. He can fight archer and archer. He can't fight knights right now. So he's just going to focus fire on knights, make sure none of them count on alive. This was a costly fight for B, but I think he actually was fine with this because in the end, he killed a lot of knights. He took out a lot of units, and now he's just going to run away with his archers. And he's hoping he can get this map control. He hasn't gone out on the deer yet or the berries yet either. But that's there available for him. This was his time, though, to take this deer and this deer. And he also never got the sacred site. He had this moment to do it. And he just missed it. And that's huge for him because getting that gold income would have been really, really important. Right after that fight, we see another issue from B. Where B, wanting to stay on the map, to stay present, didn't realize how much he was not reinforcing compared to Lucifer. Lucifer's economy is still set up and pumping. He's got 600 food a minute. He's still on the deer. And he reinforced very quickly. B, on the other hand, got slowed down by Lucifron's... He had Lucifron have some units in the north that slowed down his reinforcements. And what he really needed to do was pull this archer mass back to the middle of the map and get all his units together and stayed. He kind of checked the board. He stayed here for too long. And there are no villagers down here from Lucifron. So Lucifron's going to come in here and he's going to get some critical archer jumps here. He's not going to do an amazing amount of damage because B still has all these archers here. But he's just hunting him down. Once again, we see amazing micro. You see Lucifer keeps pulling off injured knights. So they have the chance to heal and not losing them. But now this becomes Lucifer, once again, does not want to take a fight. He wants to get back on the boar. He wants to keep surviving. His goal is to get to castle as soon as possible. He's delayed B for a long time. He needs to get his units upgraded. Once again, this back and forth fight, neither person hard committing. Both just kind of doing this back and forth poke, and when I feel low, I'm going to run away. Back and forth, back and forth. But what Lucifron's realizing is, B's not reinforcing as much as he is. Now he's just on archers. He's just making archers. B finally got deer up north, and it's going to take a minute for that Fudico to come in. So, we see how Lucifron's plan is paid off. Keeping B in his base, slowing him on food, and forcing him to go farms, has completely reduced his ability to reinforce after a big fight, while Lucifron has been able to reinforce and now he's able to keep pushing b back 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 finally at the 21 minute mark lucifer realizes it's now or never he gathers resources and drops the guild hall both sides have majorly reinforced we notice it's pure archer mass almost lucifer on 64 archers and 16 knights b on what's going to be 61 archers 20 spears 17 gazis and b is at 20 military ahead 20 military ahead, but it's finally getting his first sacred site, so that's that's a bummer. But what Lucifer realizes is a really key point. If he can get the castle and survive, then he can push in right when B goes castle. And as Delhi, his upgrades take a long time to come in. While for Lucifer, he has upgrades a lot faster, and he's gonna have that moment where his upgrades are in, but B's are not for him to kill him. So he's gonna wait, he's gonna wait for his upgrades to come in, which is huge. So many times, even in these top level maps, we see pro players take fights before their upgrades are come in. B realizes, shit, <laughs> he's aged up, he's getting his upgrades, I need to age up right now and get my upgrades. So he throws on the command defender as fast as possible, and boy, what he really needed to do <laughs> was get 
uh, scholars in each building good for upgrades. He needs more scholars in his moss to increase the upgrade speed. And I found him, I'm almost just pulling my villagers north. Because you know Lucian's going to be coming. And I don't know if you can hold this with feudal units. He sends Gazis on our raid, but those Gazis are going to be at home. Lucian immediately pushes, and this is the timing attack we're talking about. He knows he's going to hit right when his veteran upgrade for archers hit. And he starts pumping spearmen, and he's going to start sending in men at arms as well. Which is a smart change. If you think about him, Castle, even if he gets veteran knight, uh, his veteran knights, spearmen can still do work on those knights. B has really nothing that counters men at arms. Yes, his Gazi Raiders do, but those are feudal men at arms. Castle men at arms against feudal Gazis are going to do work. So we see the walk in, and Lucian's going to walk in. He's not going to be afraid. He's going to go in and take this fight immediately. And this is a pretty big mass by B. But. Once again, veteran archers against feudal archers. You Another thing that Lucifer did was huge. What was the first military upgrade he got? Angled surfaces. Plus two arrow defense. That's the first upgrade he got. That's going to make his archers way tankier than B's archers. And that's going to make it so his knights don't take any extra damage. It's going to be one. Which even before, I think it was one. Oh well, but still, for his archers, this is a massive upgrade. He's also going to, right now, his second upgrade, balance projectiles, another plus one for his archers. So his archers, while he has less of them, actually, he has more than B, they're going to pack a massive punch, and they're going to shred everything in B's army. We're going to watch this play out really quickly. He takes the fight, he knows, I, I have to take this fight right now. Lucifer cannot let B upgrade his units to Castle Age units, and B has a minute 41 left in these veteran archers and him taking this fight is really unfortunate he needed to wait but he also knew he had nowhere to run like this was his only food this was his only wood it, it was very obvious that if he didn't take this fight lucifer would just hunt down and kill all his villagers so he had to take it but just perfect timing attack by lucifer wipes up all of these units he's gonna walk in and just start go villager hunting and b gives up because he knows this is gg so once again if you want to see a great example of delaying a fight, of keeping pressure, but not over-aggressing, of waiting for your best moment to strike and identifying that moment, this game of Lucifer vs. B is a great example of that. You'll find it on EGC TV's uh, YouTube, just like all these games we're looking at. I highly suggest checking out that one. The next game we want to look at comes from the Wham! BC series. This one was amazing. Shout out to Wham! taking a series against Beastie. Uh, and he just did it with some amazing gameplay. I want to specifically look at this game of Rus versus Ayubid. Ayubid Fast Castle is something I see a lot of players struggle with that I coach. And so it's awesome to see a pro player go against the strategy and kind of show off some of the things we can take. Of course, most of us can't play at the level Wham can. By most of us, I mean none of us really can play at the level Wham and Beastie can. But the decisions they make are things we can learn from. So Wham understands that... Uh, I bid fast castle is a very all-in, and of course, the number one way to stop a fast castle is cut off food, cut off gold. If someone reaches castle and they have no gold, they basically haven't reached castle. They can't make any of their castle units. If they have no food, they can't make units. So that's going to be Wham's decision, and Wham does this in a lot of interesting ways that show how he's completely focused in on this goal of using his feudal army to make BC's castle worthless. So let's let's check in some things that he does. The first important thing Wham does is he goes golden. Gate. That's right, the Rus do have a different landmark besides the Kremlin, the Golden Gate. And I've, I've, I've done this theory crafting with some other people about what's the best way for the Rus to handle this matchup. And I thought Golden Gate was a great option, because here's the thing. Wham is acknowledging he's going all in. This feudal push has to work. If it doesn't work, Ayubids are going to get the relics, they're going to get raid him to death. And the Kremlin at that point doesn't matter, because I've had people say, well, the Kremlin's really important, it's a fast castle, you need the Kremlins to defend. Wham's going to be all over the map. Wham's going to have to get on the deer. He's going to get on the boar. And so the Kremlin can't protect him at that point. Instead, what's more helpful is getting a golden gate, which allows you to rebalance your eco without sacrificing resources. He gets free resources from the golden gate, which allows him to get the exact things he needs to make sure he's getting out the exact unit he needs. So this is a brilliant switch up for him, recognizing I'm not defending, I'm attacking. And this golden gate's going to maximize my eco usage. I just think it's really smart from him. 
because he's going to do the usual opening of a military wing because he wants to use the Desert Raider to, of course, slow down Wham. And in his mind, I bet he's expecting a Bruce Fast Castle. We saw the same game play out earlier where actually it was Wham as the IU bids against Lucifron on Bruce. Lucifron went 2TC, Wham went Fast Castle, and he beat him because he just shut down Lucifron's second TC. And so just from experiencing that bet, Wham's like, I can't go 2TC against Beastie. I, I need to not allow him to use that Fast Castle to its full extent. So we enter Feudal, and look what Wham's already noticed. He drops down a stable in our arch range immediately. He's going to make units instantly. And I want you to notice his resources are always going to be at zero. But look what he's noticed. He noticed that Beastie's berries at the front. His next berries at the front. Deer, front, gold, front. He has a back gold here, and we can see in a second he has a back berries, but really BC's all of his resources are front facing. So this plan has a chance to work instantly from the jump. BC's going to drop a uh, a tower to protect his gold. He's actually going to drop two towers, I think, if I remember correctly. Wham sees the berries back here, and here's what Wham has to acknowledge. He's not going to stop BC from going castle. Ayubit's going to just do it too quickly and efficiently. But the second BC hits castle, Wham's going to be there he's going to get nothing from it. As we see two towers, BC's very aware of this. He's just going to mass up and get ready to go. Also, he's just really effective being one of his scouts. With three scouts, you can actually do a significant amount of damage to these villagers. He already has this one in half health. He had another one. I think he almost killed. Um, but another key thing, he's keeping Wan, uh, BC's Desert Raider in his base. BC never sends his Desert Raider forward just because of how annoying these scouts are. So we'll examine how Wham is getting ready to do this attack. We're at the 7.30 mark. Wham has rallied all his units right next to the gold. He already has three archers, a knight, and a horseman. I think the horseman is probably a misclick. He has more units coming. He's doing 1-1-1. One, one, one. So doing, he's doing uh, spearmen. Spearmen because if BC goes castle, BC will probably make camel lancers immediately. So the spearmen are for the lancers. What are the two things he prioritizes? Well, he needs to get his blacksmith upgrades. He gets arrow defense, because they are going to be under towers, and they're going to be under TC. So his units having extra arrow defense is critical, and then he immediately gets the engineering. And he's going to be walking in on this base the second BC hits castle. Let's watch this happen. He immediately has macroed perfectly into a ram. Look at these resources. He is right now on 72 food, 150 wood, and 90 gold. He hasn't even touched gold yet, because he had so much hunt, he was able to make his first upgrades, and he can use the golden gate that he never needs gold. He can sell wood for gold via the golden gate. So whenever he needs a knight here and there or an upgrade, he just sells wood from the golden gate, gets it immediately. He also got lumber preservation. So he just keeps selling the, all the extra wood he gets, which makes sense. As the ruse, he has extra wood gathering. So it makes sense to use wood as your gold. And he just mass archers, mass spearmen behind that as well. So he's gonna get this ram down instantly he's scouting he's checking bc's already off the berries because he's afraid <laughs> he doesn't want wham to kill him on the berries but bc's also done another interesting thing bc's going to growth wing so he didn't rush up as fast as he could but he's going to growth wing so we give him eight extra villagers which i think the beastie is is a cushion he understands he's probably going to lose villagers on this fight eight extra is nice he also makes sure every one of these uh berry bushes is an extra hundred food so he purposely did not gather all the berries from any of the bushes, so these will all get an extra hundred food. It's a huge thing for your Ibid players. If you ever go growth, make sure you don't take all the berries off a berry bush. You get extra food then. We're just gonna watch that because this isn't a long game. Tower dropped. He's gonna get a second one down. Two rams is all he needs. And you notice he's waiting. He's waiting for when PC hits castle. That's his, that's the timing. Once again, we think we talk about timing attacks. This is a timing attack. While he's doing that, he's sending villagers out to the hunt. And he's going to make sure he's on these resources and allow him to keep, keep massing units. And there he goes. He actually attacks before BC hits castle, but he knows BC's on the way up. One thing he does that is a smart thing to do, and if you have the macro to do this, do it. It's hard, hard though. He put all his infantry in the, in the battering ram. So one, it's that they're not taking arrow fire as they come up, and two, when units come up to kill the rams, he can pop out the spearmen immediately and start slicing and dicing. His archers are also right here to pick off villagers. So he puts them back in the ram, and this is just, it's beautiful micro. Wham's units have taken barely any damage, that's when he sends the knights in. The knights are used to do the extra damage from his charge. They're not there to just keep fighting, because 
most importantly, the camel on East makes his knights weaker. One tower down, second tower down, and now the plan comes to fruition. <clears throat> All BC has to do is make sure Wham never gets on these resources. So what's he do? He plants one scout, boom, here. He's already on this gold here. BC's only resources available to him are the sheep under TC and these in this wood. And just watch how uh, Wham just keeps it on him. BC is going to be able to make, oh, he housed himself. See, even the pros make mistakes. BC has enough resources to make two camel lancers, and that's it. And B is already sending across the spearmen for these camel lancers. Each, he also is going to start dropping towers wherever his villagers go out on the map. But just watch these rotations. He's just rotating. He's rotating. He's having his rams kill houses just to try to be annoying and house Beastie. He has his scout on the back side to make sure that Beastie isn't sneaking out for the berries down here, the goal back here. So Beastie cannot move without Wham knowing. And he's just going to keep massing resources, units. Wham is not thinking about castle at all. Because Beastie's technically not in castle. Any unit that Beastie makes that is not a camel lancer is going to be futile. Not only that, look what he did by attack. This is a key thing. I often see people just attack buildings. Attacking houses is really effective. Since Wham destroyed that house, BC's Camel Lancers can't pop out. Because he's housed. He has to drop two houses in the back right here. Now Wham's just trying to, he just keeps popping diligence, but also he knows he can wait. He doesn't need to take a fight right now. He's just going to keep massing units and bleed BC dry. Because once again, BC has no way to get out. I just love watching this from Wham's perspective because you can really see how he plays this out. He's going to keep going, he keeps poking, he keeps poking, he has full coverage, he keeps sending units, he keeps sending units. Once again, using the Golden Gate, this time I think he sold wood and then bought food. I mean, just whatever he needs, the Golden Gate allows any allows him to fix map for mistakes. Now Beast is going to try to come out and delay Wham's eco, he's going to have the Camel Lancers actually come out and raid, but since Wham put up towers, he's it's not going to do much. And also a key thing, Wham never keeps all his villagers on one food source. He spreads them out. So even though Beastie is raiding one of the food sources, Wham's fine. He's still getting food. He's just massing units, massing units, massing units. Right now, Wham is at 42 military. Beastie's at 12. Beastie has to go into archers. And guess what? They're feudal archers. They're not anything special. Feudal archers. That's it. And BC realizes how stuck he is, so he comes down to get on this berries, and what does Wham notice? He's around the berries. It's the only place BC can go. So Wham's just going to circle around. He's going to use his scout to block the wall. Keeps blocking the wall. But even then, it doesn't matter. BC can just circle with his with his uh, archers and his spears, and Wham can't stop him. Wham literally cannot stop him. Luckily, BC has textiles, so these villagers are tanking hits, but like literally, BC can't do anything. He doesn't have enough units. He can't make enough units. And he's fighting with mostly feudal archers. So it's not like he's in castle anyway. And he just plays Ring on the Rosie. And this is... Man, this is so painful to watch, right? At this point, he's trying to kill as many villagers as possible. Now, shout out to Beastie. He does sneak out villagers to the gold. And he realized... And this is a smart thing for those of you who are being pushed like this if the opponent's army is on one side jump on the resources immediately so he jumps on these berries and tries to just get some berries he sends the villagers up to the gold out here but at this point's too late it's honestly too late wham has built such a military force that all he needs to do is to chop rams and walk in it's it's too late for beastie because let's see how many kills has wham gotten wham's killed six villagers um and has lost to himself but bc also has been struggling to make villagers, I think, just because of his food situation. There's more villas. And it's, it's just like he he just put a... It's, he's like a bow constrictor. He's wrapped himself around Beastie and just slowly choking the life out of him. Textbook. Textbook. So if you want to watch a game to see how to respond to the fast castle, especially Ibid Fast Castle, this is a great example. You might say, well, I'm, I don't play the Roost. The, the quality still apply. What can your Civ do to boost your eco? What can you do to get down production as soon as possible? Because Wayne made sure that his villagers 
immediately got down a barracks, got down units, we're sending them out. He got siege engineering, and he he had a goal in mind, and he macro to that, and he went all in. He did not waver. He went all in, and it worked because going fast castle the way I bitch just went fast castle, he had no units. So watch that. Watch how Ram executes it, especially if you're a risk player. It's beautiful. What I'm gonna look at is Marine Lord versus Puppy Paw. This was an amazing series. Marine Lord wins 2-0. But watching Marine Lord and Puppy Pop, both are amazing players. But every game I watch Marine Lord, it's like he does everything perfectly. Exactly perfectly. I just don't know how he does it. Um, this game, you will want to watch this game if you want to see, one, how to go 2-3 to three TC, the different parts of the game. Because Marine Lord's going to go 2-3 to three TC and castle. 2-3 to three TC and castle. And we'll talk about why he does that. Two, how to defend. Defending is so hard, and I've watched so many Marine Lord games now where he defends something that I think 98% of people would quit, and he lives and wins. It's it's insane. So we're going to talk about how he defended as well. So if you want to watch, one, how to pressure Molly and Kaboom, two, how to catch up eco-wise, three, how to defend, this is the game to watch. Which, once again, this is on EGC TV, two, um... Once again, I said at the start, shout out to all of these top level players leaving their profiles open. Um, none of them block the replays, so you can search up any of them. Please don't message them weird stuff. Don't <laughs> don't like send a bunch of friend requests. But you can watch their games, and it's so cool to be able to go to all these pro players and just watch it straight from their perspective. Um, so I appreciate that. So, openings. Marine Lord as Ayubid. He's talked about how he loves Ayubid. Um... And instead of fast castling, he's going to go actually pressure Molly's because the Molly and Cow Boom is too good. Um, if you let the Molly and Cow Boom get up, something that the caster said, which I think is a great way to think about Molly and Cow Boom, why it's kind of unfair. If they can get it up into castle, their eco is literally set. They have cows for food, they have pit mines for gold, and they just make units. Every other sieve, when they enter castle, has to do that transition of, I have to get my farms down to get food. I have to get on the map to get gold, and that takes time, and that slows you down. There's no slowdown for Malians. They hit castle and is off to the races. So it is a very hard sieve to play against. Um, if you want to see an example of this, um, B versus Beastie. Beastie plays Malians. B plays China, and he tries to Song Dynasty 2TC out eco boom him, and Beastie just tears him apart. Just tears him apart. Um, so let's watch how Marine Lord deals with this. So what to play against the Malians? Marine Lord's goal is that he wants to go, he wants to pressure the Malian gold pit mines to make sure that they can't just get free cows and make sure that he's also starving for food. He wants to, he knows he probably can't stop the cow boom, but he wants to delay it enough that he can catch back up with the boom later. He's going to start by dropping two archery ranges and he goes up with the military wing desert raiders. Now you might go, well, isn't Puppy Law just going to make javelins? And he will. The key thing that uh, Marine Lord is betting on is they can just outmass archers. The thing about javelin throwers is that they tend to overkill. Um, if you have a lot of javelin throwers, they're going to way overkill each archer. So actually, the bigger the masses you get, the better archers hold up. So also, you'll just notice Marine Lord is just a huge favor of... He's really into just making huge archery masses. Just because if you get enough archers in any sieve... They do well. So he's going to mass archers, and he's going to cross the map immediately. He's heading directly for the gold mine. He's not waiting to mass. He's going to have a desert raider. He's going to have archers, so he's going to go right now. Um, Puppy Paw scouts this out. Once again, the scouting by these pros are amazing. They always know what the other person's doing. They react instantly. Um, and you'll see a big counterplay. A huge thing to do is to chase off your opponent's scout. You'll see all the time... Pros are chasing each other's scouts away because they want to be able to make moves without their opponent knowing, um, which is why in my coaching, I emphasize scouting so, 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 so much. So Puppy Law actually drops two archery ranges because he realizes, oh, Marine Lord has dropped two archery ranges. I need to go double javelin thrower. As we enter the seven minute mark, we already see the effect of Marine Lord's pressure. There has been no fight taken. Marine Lord has dropped a barracks, not barracks, I'm sorry, a stable, and he's been making horsemen. So of course, Puppy has to respond with... Uh, Donzos, but the threat of this of this military mass that is being made by Marine Lord, which once again Puppy Paw scouted out, means he can't make cows. He's at the seven minute mark and he's making his first cow into his first cattle ranch. That is very far behind the usual boom. But Puppy Paw has to respect what Marine Lord's doing so heavily. He's finally getting his second pit mine down. 
and he's just sitting on these pit mines because he's had to put all of his wood towards the different production buildings and making units while marine lord just keeps circling he just keeps circling he's just looking for a place that he can kind of take a fight here and there but just this threat of his existence is slowing down puppy paws boom immensely at the nine minute 30 mark still no fight's been taken but Marine Lord has realized this is his time. He has cut unit production and he has immediately macroed to Castle. Puppy Paws read this. He sees how many unit villagers are on gold. So he knows that most likely Marine Lord's going to Castle. And he's going to beat Puppy Paw there by a lot. Once again, think about what just making units has done for Marine Lord. He has slowed down Puppy Paws boom. So at the 9 minute 40 mark, he only has 5 cows down. He also, that means Puppy Paws nowhere close to going to Castle because he wants to get all his cows down before he makes his landmark. While Marine Lord has only three less military units, but is now going to Castle in a second. He just clicked on the button. And here's, remember, especially with IU bid and Abbasid, they get to age up without having to put any villagers on it. It sucks if you're behind, but if you're ahead, he gets to continue to collect resources while that's happening. And he's going with the Growth Wing, which is going to give him eight villagers immediately. And once again, he does a little IU bid trick and not killing any of his berry bushes so he gets more food and all he has to do is protect this army keep it alive age it up and then use that army as a defense mechanism to do his own boom because he knows he can't actually stop the malium boom but if he can slow it down he can then get his own tcs and he's going to drop two tcs because that's how much he needs to get down to out boom the malians we're about to hit the 12 minute mark and marine lord's about to hit castle in a way, Marine Lord note feels that there is a timing attack here. He has this time to get his upgrades, which he knows he gets the arch upgrade, and he's going to get air defense upgrade, and he knows he has a moment where he could potentially do damage before Puppy Paw hits Castle. But notice, once again, the pressure he's putting on Puppy Paw. Puppy is going to go up to Castle before he gets all his cows down, just because he is afraid of this Castle attack by Marine Lord. At the same time, though, Puppy has set up walls, so it's not going to be an easy walk in Marine Lord. Marine Lord is going to walk in, just try to pick some bills. It's one. Right on this walls. He does this all the time. He's just showing presence and forcing a Puppy Ball to react and respond to him, and he's going to Gulams. This is a great unit. Yes, Musafati technically would counter Gulams, but Gulams with a double attack hold up pretty well. And his goal, once again, how much eco can I delay? to buy myself time because I don't think Merlin Lord, Merlin Lord, Mer, sorry, Merlin Lord's under any impression that he's stopped the boom but he has killed two Puppy Paws villagers he's gotten eight free villagers so he's ten ahead and he has maintained his military from feudal into castle so he's going to try to do damage now let's see what he tries to do once again avoids the fight does not take a fight he can't take pushes back in still a lot of javelin throws so he backs out but look at this done. He has purposely distracted the military so his gulams can start running in and hunting villagers. Merlin Ward does this constantly. He will have his main force attack one side of a base. And literally, all he did was attack a wall. But it forces a reaction from his opponent, and then he sends in a couple units in the backside to you know, start killing villagers, start pushing them off hunts. Then he saves them. He rarely throws units away very very effective but he's just going to keep on doing these little pushes try to find a space that he can do damage at the 1450 mark we see how marine lord has plans of implants he wanted to see if he could do damage in castle but puppy had defended really well there's no damage to be done once again does not throw away his army he backs out and he puts thir uh, 13 villagers on stone and he goes it's time for me to drop my two tcs and try to and try to outboom Malians because he can't keep fighting this. He knows at this point, Puppy Paw is getting farther and farther and farther ahead. He's got to get down some sort of eco advantage. He one does get relics, which is huge, but he immediately macros into two TCs. <clears throat> Let's talk about where he's going to place these. He has to go two TCs because if he goes one, <clears throat> excuse me, if he goes one. That's once again double villagers is enough to beat out uh, full cows and three pet mines. But three TCs might be enough. If he can get to 120 villagers, 110 villagers with farms, he will win. That's a big if, right? First TC goes on the wood line. This is critical. It, one, kind of shades this deer here. It protects this gold mine. It protects this wood line here. 
gives a give us gives a space for these villagers around here to hide. And what you're going to notice, Marine Lord does with his TCs is create kind of death zones here. If if a uh, if puppy is to dive, he Marine Lord is setting up a way that multiple TCs and what you'll see soon is multiple towers will be hitting those units as they walk through. Puppy Chop has to do a raid. Marine Lord very well avoids those raids. He's going to get textile soon, <clears throat> at least I think, but he's already got two of the relics. He has some camel lancers sitting off to the side that he's going to use to raid later, but now Marine Lord is going to be in complete defense mode. So he's got the first TC down, and then the third TC comes down the other wood line. Why wood lines? Well, he knows he won't be able to go out on food. Soon, any food outside the TC range is going to be out off limits. So the wood lines are vital to protect because he needs farms. So these town centers are going to be right next to the wood lines, so he can continue getting wood, and he's going to set up farms in the back. He's got to just have these farms live. He is still making units the entire time, keep in mind, though. He had to slow down to get the TCs down, but he is making units, and he's going to see him start making towers. Now watch what happens next. Puppy comes in with sofas. Now already he has the first tower up. He has upgraded the tower. He's putting, making it fortified. We're going to see Marine Lord put down multiple towers to once again create these death zones where overlapping TC fire any time that Puppy enters, he'll have to take a lot of damage. And now he's just booming. He has all three TCs going. And he has to delay, delay, delay. So what do we do against this? Well, one, he starts walling up the flanks, and he's getting the resources outside while he can. Two, what's good against a huge mass of archers and javelin throwers and infantry in general? A Maganel. Once again, Marine Lord knows what he needs to do. He needs to create safe places of defense. He needs to avoid taking the fight until he can. And he needs to create walls and towers to protect his villagers he's not going to fight unless he has to he's going to build he's going to use his ability to build a maganel but if you were not iu bids you would just build a maganel anyway but you just got to get maganels out so he's drop this maganel back here i mean marine lord is so good at moving his villagers puppy never has a clean shot on villagers he's just constantly moving them constantly avoiding it comes in here and tries to burn this tc Marine Lord actually can't lose this TC. He needs both TCs up to be able to continuously make villagers. He's going to bring the Manjanique up, which is the Magnum for the Ayubids. Takes the fight, but doesn't push past. Once again, he's using his defensive pressure, his defensive presence. He has units popping out right next to the TCs, so he has the defender's advantage there. He needs to put units in his TC, but the outpost is shooting Spring Ults. And he can just sit in his pocket and let the Mac Manjanique do work. Once again, Puppy can't stay here for too long. He tries to snap the Manjanique, but here's the thing that... When you're playing defense, you have to value some things more than others. So, Marilla doesn't actually have to value villagers. He's making three villagers at a time. So, villagers aren't actually like the thing he needs to value. He needs to value his Manjanique. That's a vital survival. So he will pull villagers constantly to heal this Manjanique, even if it means they die, because they have to have to stay up. Look how much work it's doing. And he's constantly choosing it to fire in village in groups of ranged units. Pushes him back. Now here's the problem. <laughs> um Puppy's gonna just keep making units. Just keep making units. And yes, really Lord gets some raids off, he actually kills. Um, 14 villagers of puppies, so these this Camel Lancer raids were huge. Notice me time that raid, he timed the raid exactly when Puppy pushed in, so Puppy was late to respond to it. But this isn't over. We know if you play defense, you have to play defense multiple times. He pushes out, he chases, but Puppy's going to reinforce his army very quickly. You see, he's already back up to 64. So what, once again, what is Marine Lord doing? He needs to get down farms. So he is just rallying to wood consistently, and then taking chunks of wood villages and putting them on food. He's gonna fill, he needs to fill up this whole back area with farms if he's gonna live. During this process, whenever he's getting raided, he's repairing palisades. He's creating multiple layers of walls. He tries to get these resources, but he can't. 
keeps keeps his army alive, brings him back. He just survives, 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 survives. It's crazy. It's absolutely wild. So Puppy coming back with 84 military because he never stops producing, even on 50 villagers. Like check the eco amounts. He at this point Marine Leader is out producing him, but barely, barely, with double the bills. So this is the push that Puppy has to win. He has to win this push. He's attacking from multiple sides, which once again, Marine Lord has a group of archers down here. Even just something to push off these units when they come through. But look where he's taking the fight. Um, Puppy Ball is going to try to do the strategy of attacking at multiple fronts, which is all well and good. I don't know, maybe he should attack all at one spot. But look where Marine Lord's taking this fight. Marine Lord is waiting under the TC, under the outpost. He's keeping the Maganel back. These spears are sticking right next to the Maganel. And what, he, what he'll do often is pull the Maganel back between the buildings so that um, uh, so that units can't surround it. The spears can use to protect it. Puppy never makes a spring ult, crazy enough. Um, I really don't know why he didn't. All he needed to do was make three spring ults, and he's fine. But this mansion just lives forever. Doesn't die. All the time, he's just making villagers. He's making farms. Raids come in. He's ready for it. Look how quickly he adjusted to that. And he knows what he can protect. He knows he can walk his military over here and take this fight because he can overwhelm this because Puppy was split. And if Puppy comes through the center, what's he going to attack? There's just TCs here. Drops more production. Puts up another tower. Another tower of spring ult upgrades. Puppy's killing bills, but once again, he's producing out three TCs. Whenever Puppy enters this axis of death, he's just getting shot by multiple things. He's getting stuck between the buildings. Marine Lord uses the defender's advantage here perfectly. Once again, he's lost my three villagers, but considering how many he's making and where Puppy's attacking from, that's fine. But I would highly suggest, if you want to see good defense, watch this on one speed. I'm, I'm speeding through this, but just watch this on one speed. He's... Look at this. So, once again, we can see what Marine Lord values. He values the TC, so he will send villagers to repair it. He values the Siege, he will send villagers to repair it, and he keeps it in the center. He somewhat values villagers, but he keeps on repairing walls, and then he'll run them away. And whenever he's getting attacked... He will try to delay that attack with a few units, but use his main army to, to just completely wipe one army at a time. Puppy just really is trying to break through and kill all these villagers in one go. When I really think he needed just to mass up all together, drop two or three spring ults, and a few rams, and walk in that way. Because this is actually Tomb Leon's benefit. Comes in here. Look, he's killing villagers, but not enough. Marine Lord is still at 100 villagers. When you're pumping out 3 TCs, it's hard to kill enough villagers to make it count. No villagers being killed, but... I mean, these are still all defended by the TC, basically. So, at this point, Marine Lord's eco is too good. He just pushes out, and he's going to clean up the game. Crazy stuff. So, if you want to see... Just, just think about what Marine Lord did. Slow down the the age up. I mean, slow down the Malian cow boom to give himself time to age up. With three TC on the back of the army, he's got, he's got the alive since feudal. This army that he uses to pressure and keep alive. Pros are so good at just not losing their army. In three, once he got down the defense, he put up walls and he played within his base. He got down a Maganel. He rotated his units. He kept moving his villagers. And he kept the things alive that mattered. He valued his TCs, he valued his siege, and in the end it paid off. At this point, his eco becomes so good. His goal, I need to get down farms. At that point, his eco becomes so good, he can just push out and just walk over Puppy Paw because he has no, he won't be able to make enough units to defend. Amazing stuff. Um, so that's our last game we look at. I'm really excited for next weekend. I hope to do another one of these reviews. Um, I hope you learned something from checking out these games, and I highly suggest you watch the replays on EGC TV, or just go to these top-level players' um, profiles and watch them, watch the replays. Uh, you can learn a lot, a lot from watching them. Um, but as always, um, it's Paper Cut.
good luck on your games.